So, Patrick, uh, IR2, it's finally been transposed on the 22nd of April. And in the lead up to its transposition, there was a lot of discussion about how it would potentially impact on small and single member schemes. Can, can you help and, and flesh out maybe on the impact that the regulation has had on these schemes? Yeah, so uh, it won't come as a surprise, I think, to many in the industry that the regulations will apply now to one member arrangements. Um, there was speculation over the last few years that we would have a derogation like we had previously under the, the first IORC directive, but, uh, but it is the case that the, uh, the regulations now will apply to one member arrangements such as the small self minister scheme and the executive pension plan. So one member occupational pension schemes. Um, what that means is that you have a whole raft of governance um, you know, policy and uh, investment requirements for one member arrangements that you didn't have before. Um, th th there's a lot for sponsors and for members to consider, I think, um, certainly on the investment side, I think that those restrictions were the most controversial uh, and the ones most talked about in the single member pension space um, in the lead up to, to transposition. And so there's, um, there's a lot to do. I think in the long run, it will make schemes such as the small self administered scheme more expensive uh, for members um, because obviously the costs uh, and compliance, cost of compliance with the regulations will be passed on to members ultimately uh, and probably less attractive as well because you just don't have the um, investing flexibility that you would have in the past. Yeah and, and the regulations uh, when they were transposed they, they contained a number of exemptions in relation to small schemes that were uh, established prior yeah. to the transposition date. What, what are those? Yeah, so th there are some exemptions uh, for, and I guess concessions uh, to small self management schemes, or as they call them in the regulations, one member arrangements that were established uh, before the transposition date uh, of, of 22nd of April. It means that the majority of the requirements of the regulations won't apply for five years to that scheme type, that for those schemes that were established before the transposition date. Um, now, some of the requirements will, such as the uh, investment and borrowing rules, and as well the, the number of trustees need to be appointed to the scheme, but the majority of the rules, so a, a lot of the governance requirements won't actually apply into the five-year period. As well as, um, they're not, the, while the investment and borrowing rules kick in immediately, they aren't retroactive, so we don't have, so providers of SAS or SAS members don't have to start looking at selling assets uh, so they won't apply to existing investments or borrowing arrangements that were in place before uh, the regulations became effective. Yeah, well, providers uh, of SASs and small executive one-man schemes, there's a number of requirements in there for, for trustees. What are you seeing in relation to providers? What are their main issues of concern with the regs? I think I think the big one is the, the member trustee model. So previously with... Um, for instance, the small self minister scheme, you had two trustees. You had the uh, pensioner trustee, typically the provider, um, together with the, the member trustee. And that's why they were often known as self-directed schemes and that the member trustee had quite a bit of investment power. But now you're looking at a situation where um, the, the member trustee isn't really going to be in a position to meet the new qualification and knowledge requirements and the fitness and probity requirements in the regulations. So providers would probably say, well, okay, we're just going to go with a sole corporate professional trustee acting as a trustee of the scheme. This, yeah, tr throws up some issues, certainly for, for providers in that, you know, if there are bigger providers that are already regulated by Mifid 2 or Solvency 2, this would be familiar enough territory in terms of what, you know, the requirements they'll have to meet. But otherwise, it, it will be quite difficult for smaller providers and for members. I think there's a loss then of that investment freedom. Um, it'll also be interesting to see if the Pensions Authority, you know, regulates, and I'm sure they will look at engaging with trustee boards of SASs in, in a manner similar to how they've engaged with master trust boards. Um, and, you know, they've been quite exacting in that respect, I think. Yeah. And you've spoken on the changes too in the investment and borrowing regime on SASs. What are the alternatives and what, what can people do and providers, what are they looking at to possibly yeah. work around here? 
So one of one of the big ones on the investment restrictions is that investments must be predominantly invested in regulated markets. So for your one member arrangement for your SAS or your um, executive pension plan, predominantly invested is thought to mean or is, is said to mean fifty percent or or at least so over well sorry I should say over fifty percent so fifty percent fifty one percent at least. So that's the requirement. Now that wasn't there before. So people who had SAS had a good bit of freedom in terms of investing in. Uh, property, uh, private company loan notes and things like that. The alternatives now and the those pension vehicles that are unaffected by the regulations would they can still do that would be uh, a non-standard PRSA or a, a bio bond. So with a standard PRSA, of course, most people are familiar with the standard PRSA. It's quite restrictive in terms of what investing you can do with it. A non-standard PRSA is you've a lot more freedom. And you can invest in geared vehicles such as the and the same team of trust that you know will, will purchase the property if you're looking to invest in property. A bio bond, of course, is a contract with a provider or a life company where um, you look to transfer your benefits from your occupational pension scheme once you leave service or when the scheme is wound up. Uh, you transfer your benefits and then you have what you can contribute to a bio bond, you have a good degree of investing and borrowing freedom freedom within that. Um, so there are the alternatives through really the bio bond and the non-standard PRSA and I think most providers uh, will be looking at that in terms of you know when they're allowing savers to look at unregulated investments they're the kind of vehicles that will be used I think going forward. Yeah. And, and, and just finally the, the Pensions Authority have indicated that guidance will be provided throughout the, the rest of the year in relation to the IR2 uh, regulation. Is there anything we, we can expect in the small uh, the SAS, uh, sphere uh, in relation yeah. to the guidance that's coming out? I, I think we're, we're just hoping for clarification on maybe some of the cloudier uh, aspects of uh, and language in the, in the regulations. There's probably a lot of terms in there that are undefined, and so we just need to know what they mean, such as the phrase collectively adequate on the trustee qualification side. Um, but generally, I mean, the Pensions Authority won't be able to change the regulations and they are what they are going forward. Uh, the rebalancing one will be interesting because a lot of providers are concerned about, okay, if you have, you know, a, a small self administered scheme with, uh, and at one point your valuation for your unregulated assets is 60%, um, or if, you know, the value of your regulated assets drop, does that mean you have to sell assets? Uh, do you have to contribute to the scheme? I mean, the, the, some clarification is, is hoped for on, on things like that. Uh, but I, I think in the long run, like, as I said, the, the Pensions Authority can't change the regulations. They are what they are. And we're going to into a space where the one member arrangement, such as the, the SAS, is going to be considered less uh, attractive from a member's perspective and more expensive as well. And I think you'll have the non-standard uh, PRSA becoming more popular. Of course, the, the whole of life PRSA is, is um, something that might be down the tracks as well um, as an option. And the bio bond and, and possibly the master trust as well. Um, the, the, some version of the master trust that providers of single member schemes will look at. Okay, super, Patrick. That's uh, very clear. Uh, it's well, one thing that is clear is that it's a lot happening in this space, and we, we can expect a lot more during the course of the year. So, thanks a million. For more video content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you'd like more information on this and other pension related topics, please go to our website, www.mhc.ie.